Welcome to Medical Monday, a special Heart to Heart with Anna podcast for Heart Month, February 2022. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of your program. I am also a heart mother. I have an adult with a single ventricle heart who is 27 years old. He's the reason I am the host of your program. On Medical Mondays, we are investigating different medical devices that have been created to improve the lives of people born with congenital heart defects. Today, we are very blessed to have a gentleman who has been hailed as the father of interventional cardiology as our guest. Dr. Terry King was the first person to implant and close an atrial septal defect, or ASD, in a human being. Today, Dr. King will tell us about how he came to create the umbrella device that paved the way for other closure devices to be used in a catheterization lab. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. King. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. My dear colleague, Dr. Phillips, of course, is on your board and has told me a great deal. And I think this is a wonderful program and a wonderful opportunity. Well, thank you. We are so honored to have you on our program. And I can't wait to hear how you came up with this device. Well, it's a moderately long story. But when I was in my fellowship, at Duke University, we were creating holes in the heart called with the balloon septostomy catheter. And then when I went to the Air Force, I actually had the opportunity to embolize the catheter that broke off from the neck and floated into the heart. And I was able to retrieve it. And that was the first time that had ever been done. Previous similar cases had to go to heart surgery. So as a fella, I began to think, why well, can't we fix holes in the heart, atrial septal defects in the top half, ventricular septal defects in the lower half, or the ductus, which is a connection outside the heart. But when I queried my colleagues and fellow doctors, the answer was always, it can't be done. So I went to the Air Force, and that's where I encountered the patient with the embolized catheter, and I was able to do that very quickly, and it just made me know that we could do this. So as I was leaving the United States Air Force, I was being interviewed at various places around the country. And one of the places was the Oxford Clinic. And during that interview, I met a doctor by the name of Noel Mills, who was quite young looking to me. I thought he couldn't be a heart surgeon, but he really was. And I thought I'd make the interview pretty quick and over probably because everybody said it can't be done. But I said, Dr. Mills, do you think we can close holes in the heart with a catheter? And lo and behold, he jumped up, ran over to a drawer, pulled out a bunch of catheters with, with discs on them. And he'd been working it when he was at the University of New York with these devices. And he said, not only do I think it can, I think we can do it. And I went to the Oxford Clinic because he said it could be done. So when I was leaving the Air Force, I was laying in the bed. It was about four o'clock in the morning. And I said, what is small enough to pass through a catheter that is big enough when in place inside the heart and open would close a hole? And it dawned on me, voila, an umbrella. And so with that, I knew I had a way of doing it because I'd been trying to figure out how I was going to do this. And so I went to the Oxford Clinic and they very graciously funded this project and encouraged the project. And then I had an uncle in LSU who was an electrical engineer and he was a professor. And I called him and asked him, could he find me a machinist that could make really tiny umbrellas? And I had envisioned two umbrellas coming together and snapping together. Two days later, he called me and said, I found this very wonderful machinist. And I drove up to Baton Rouge, actually, and met with him in the student union center and drew on the paper napkin, my concept of the cardiac umbrellas. Did you keep that napkin? No, I did not. And I'm so upset. My wife and my children were with me. And so when he told me that he could do this, I didn't care what I did with the napkin, to be honest about it. We started with that. We made some embryonic devices. We had to create models and experimental canines to make the defect and then close the defect after we recovered them. Long story short, from September when I got there to mid-December, we went through two devices. The second one I used in mid-December 1972. I actually closed a defect in a dog's heart during cardiac catheterization. And so... The room just exploded when that happened. It was incredible. 
Our research was then learned of by Edwards Laboratory in Santa Ana, California. They asked us to fly out there and Russ Jordan, who was CEO and president of the foundation, he started working with us and we developed what was ultimately the King Mills umbrella device, which was first used in human patients in the mid seventies. So that's how it came to pass. It was an exciting time because this had never been done. The heart lung machine was only being used for 10 years when I went to medical school. So heart surgery was king of the hill. And there was some criticism of this when we actually did it because heart surgery was so successful that it seemed that we didn't need to have this. But a driving force for me was I thought about these young ladies getting these sternotomies and then having the incision that you get when you have open heart surgery for the rest of their life. And I just didn't think we needed that. There were other reasons, of course. But be that as it may, with God's help and Dr. Mills and the institution and support there, we were successful in doing this. I have two quick questions, even though I wasn't planning on asking any follow-up questions. But if I'm thinking these questions, I bet my listeners are as well. First of all, how did you get the umbrella device to stay in the hole? So that was a really important and difficult thing because we didn't have echo. We didn't have CT. We didn't have MRIs. We had to develop a technique where we inflated balloons in the heart and stuck them in the hole. And then we had to figure out how to locate the hole. So we knew it was in the middle of the wall between the two upper receiving chambers. And we had to develop a device that would be about two times the diameter of the defect. So we would know for sure we closed it. That presented a problem because if the defect is too big, you're not going to get it closed. But how we closed them, it was like a snap on your coat. One umbrella slid into the other one and both are hooked to casters. We carried them into heart through a capsule and I exposed one on the left side and it was automatically open. That was a giant step because it had a silicone ring that would allow the umbrella to open. Then I'd pull it back against the hole and then I'd pull the capsule that carried the right umbrella into the right side of the heart. I'd expose the right heart umbrella. I would slide them together and then snap them together. I could feel when they snapped and we could hear the snap by putting the stethoscope on the chest. So there were two things we did to make sure it was snapped. And then I would jiggle the caster and make sure that the umbrella stayed in place. And I'd release the right side because I had a wire running through it all the way to the left side. So if they weren't locked, I would know that. And then we would know we were not in a fail-safe position. But I jiggled it again, and they stayed locked. And then I unscrewed the left side, and there it was. So it's twice as big as a hole, and they have struts made of stainless steel and Dacron. They're different things we use today, but it just stayed there perfectly and it's been there in four of them that are alive of the original five for about 200 patient years. Wow, that's amazing. So you already answered my second question, which was, what's it made of? So stainless steel, Daphron, and it had a silicone ring. Yes. Just amazing. There are plenty of pictures in innumerable textbooks around the world about these devices. Oh yeah, I found it online too. It's amazing all the different pictures that you can find, but Friends, if you want to hear even more, you're going to need to tune in on Saturday when we get a chance to talk in more depth about this amazing invention and we learn even more about Dr. King's place in pediatric cardiology history. But that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. This is our special Medical Monday episode. Have a great day. And remember, my friends, you are not alone.